Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the Hey Min Lee murder case. This case was the subject of the podcast Serial in 2014 and the 2019 HBO docuseries titled The Case Against Adnan Saeed. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll start with the background, move to the timeline of the crime. I'll answer the question, was Adnan Saeed actually guilty? At least give my opinion. And I'll briefly talk about mental health and personality characteristics. Starting with the background, we move to 1999 in Baltimore, Maryland. 18-year-old Hey Min Lee and 17-year-old Adnan Saeed were both seniors at Woodlawn High School in Baltimore. They were together romantically, but the relationship was kept a secret because of religious differences. They were on again, off again, and eventually Lee rejected Saeed. She started dating a co-worker named Don shortly after that. Lee was well-liked. She was described as happy and joyful. She got along with people. Saeed was well-liked as well. Other than smoking marijuana, he wasn't involved in any illegal activity. Moving to the timeline of the crime. January 13, 1999. Hey Min Lee was reported missing after failing to pick up her cousin after school. As part of the investigation into why she was missing, the police spoke with Saeed. Saeed told the police that Lee was in school that day and was supposed to give him a ride home, but he was running late and thought that Lee probably left after waiting a short period of time. Nobody with whom the police spoke knew where Lee could be. No one had seen her or heard from her. This was the first time she ever failed to come home after school. On February 9, Lee's body was found in Leakin Park in Baltimore. The police received an anonymous tip on February 12, saying they should take a closer look at Saeed. Saeed had a cell phone, which really wasn't common for that time. The cell phone records showed that he had called a person named Jay Wilds. When the police talked to Wilds, he said he didn't know anything about a crime. But then his story changed, the first of several changes. Wilds claimed that Saeed had met him in the parking lot of a Best Buy and showed him Lee's dead body in the trunk of her car. Wilds then helped Saeed bury the body in Leakin Park. This was at about 7 p.m. on January 13. Wilds was interviewed by the police. Two of the interviews were recorded. During the second interview, there are tapping sounds in the background and awkward pauses as he's going through his narrative. It seems as though the police could have been assisting him in getting his story straight. Saeed was arrested on February 28 and charged with first-degree murder under this theory that he killed Lee, and Wilds helped him dispose of the body. Wilds was charged as an accessory after the fact. The first trial was declared a mistrial after the jury heard the judge accuse Saeed's defense attorney, Christina Gutierrez, of lying. This was during a sidebar, and the jury wasn't supposed to hear that. The result of the second trial would be different. Saeed would be found guilty of first-degree murder, robbery, false imprisonment, and kidnapping on February 25, 2000. He was sentenced to life in prison, plus 30 years. Jay Wilds was given a plea deal and received no jail time. In 2003, Saeed appealed his conviction, but the appeal was denied. In 2010, he appealed for post-conviction relief. The basis was ineffective assistance of counsel. His defense attorney seemingly ignored a potential alibi witness, a young woman named Asia McLean. This witness stated that she had a conversation with Saeed in the library of the high school on January 13. The reason this is important is because under the prosecution's theory of the crime, Saeed was at Best Buy at that time. Gutierrez also made a number of other mistakes. She was not a good attorney near the end of her career. She made Lyle Hutz look like F. Lee Bailey. She was disbarred by consent in 2001 after receiving about a dozen complaints. She would die in 2004. Now, Saeed also had other new evidence, but it was not on his original petition. During the trial, there were these maps generated by the cell phone company. 
they ostensibly showed the general area where a particular phone was when it was used for an outgoing or incoming call. Saeed argued that these maps were not accurate. The theory was supported by a cell phone expert who testified on behalf of the prosecution. There was actually a note on the report that said that the location of incoming calls could not be determined accurately by that information. Saeed's appeal was initially denied, but eventually he was able to get his conviction overturned. He was on track for a new trial. The prosecution appealed this decision, and they lost their first appeal, but they would later win in a 4-3 to three decision. Interestingly, the court agreed that Saeed's defense attorney was deficient, but they believed the evidence against Saeed was so strong that it wouldn't have made a difference. The court also ruled on the cell phone tower maps, saying his right to re-examine these claims on this topic had been waived. Saeed's conviction was restored. The United States Supreme Court would not hear the case. This brings us to the question, was Saeed guilty? Now, of course, I don't know, but I can offer my opinions. Let's look at the evidence both for and against. So looking at evidence that points toward guilt, Saeed had been in a relationship with Lee, and this relationship ended with him being rejected. Lee noted in her diary that Saeed was controlling, possessive, and unwilling to accept their breakup. Saeed's religious values were inconsistent with his relationship with Lee. He viewed her as an obstacle to following the values of his faith. At least at one point, he referred to Lee as the devil. Lee had approached one of her teachers and asked the teacher not to reveal her location to Saeed because the couple had been fighting. In a note written by Lee to Saeed, she explains that she is breaking up with him. On that note, he wrote the words, I'm going to kill. Saeed claimed that he did not remember what happened on January 13, so he didn't have a good memory of what he was doing that day. This is more than a little convenient for him. Saeed made no attempts to call Lee after January 13, when he had called her many times prior to that. Wilds knew where Lee's car was parked. It's hard to believe he could have known that if he wasn't involved. Witnesses partially corroborated the story of Jay Wilds, and Saeed was seen with Wilds that day. Saeed loaned his car to Wilds on January 13. Apparently, this never happened before. It not only supports the idea that they were in some type of conspiracy, it sets up Saeed to ask Lee to give him a ride home. Again, something out of the ordinary. In the prosecution's theory of the crime, Saeed strangled Lee in her car. Right, so that ride home matches up with their theory. Now look at the evidence pointing towards Saeed being not guilty. Saeed was not a hardened criminal. As I mentioned, he only used marijuana. We would have to believe that he jumped from that to murder in the first degree. It seems like a bit of a stretch that he went from being a typical teenage kid to Hannibal Lecter. Jay Wilds has been in trouble with the law many times. He was not a credible witness. On top of that, key parts of his story changed, and it appears he was coached. He was offered an incredible plea deal, considering the fact that he admitted involvement. It was almost too good to be true. Saeed has an alibi witness. It's too bad he didn't introduce that witness when it would have helped him, but it still points to him being not guilty. There's no physical evidence that ties Saeed to the crime. DNA testing was not done until long after the trial. It demonstrated that Saeed's DNA was not on Lee's body or in her vehicle. To determine Saeed was guilty, we would have to believe that this 17-year-old, who was inexperienced in committing crimes, managed to strangle a woman to death without leaving any DNA on her or at the crime scene. Nothing under her fingernails, nothing anywhere. And somehow he did this without sustaining injuries to his own body. He wasn't scratched, no bruises, no marks on his hands. It's a little hard to believe. Even Gary Ridgway, the Green River killer, regularly was scratched and otherwise injured during his attacks. He killed over 70 victims, many by manual strangulation. The cell phone tower map was inaccurate, or at least it seems to have been inaccurate. And then the last bit of evidence pointing toward the idea that Saeed was not guilty is that there were alternate suspects in this case. The boyfriend Don, the alleged passerby who found Lee's body, his name was Alonzo, 
and of course, Jay Wilds, the only person who has actually admitted involvement in this case. With all that in mind, do I think that Adnan Saeed was guilty? Yes, I think that Saeed was guilty, meaning I believe he actually did it, but I do not think he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I think he did it because he had motive and opportunity to a degree that is more pronounced than the alternate suspects. I think there is reasonable doubt in many areas of this case. What really stands out for me would be the fact that the police never really investigated Don, Lee's new boyfriend, and the fact there's no physical evidence tying Saeed to the murder. I just have trouble believing that he was that efficient a killer when he had no homicidal experience. Was there an elective at his high school titled Strangle Like a Pro, Jilted Lover Homicide Tactics? One would think the parents would not be too happy with a class like that being offered, mostly because of the murder part. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors, we don't really see much information in this case about potential mental health factors. As far as personality, Saeed appears to have a high level of openness to experience, conscientiousness and extroversion, and a low level of agreeableness and neuroticism. He doesn't really seem to fit the typical profile of a killer, which is just another element that makes this case so odd. One of the interesting questions that comes up related to Saeed is why did he decide to turn down the deal that the state offered him? Before the state won the final appeal, they offered Saeed the opportunity to plead guilty and serve only four more years for a total of 23 years. He turned this offer down, and now, of course, it's likely he will spend the rest of his life in prison. Here are my thoughts on this. This was an unusual decision under the circumstances. If he is truly innocent, then the answer is fairly straightforward. He didn't want to plead guilty to something he didn't do. I think a lot of people can appreciate this point of view. He'd rather stay in prison and be able to defend his innocence than admit guilt and be free. If he's actually guilty, he may have turned it down because it would have destroyed his identity. He is kind of a folk hero in a way. He has a lot of people telling him that he is truly innocent. He would have to go from being a person that many people believe is genuinely innocent to being a self-admitted killer. Perhaps he has grown somewhat comfortable with his life in prison, like it's not completely miserable for him, and he views being thought of as innocent as part of his identity. I think this argument is understandable. What else can Saeed be known for at this point? Even if he got out of prison, his prospects for success are bleak, as he is a convicted murderer. This is his way to be well-known and well-regarded. This plea deal would have taken that from him. That's a lot to give up in his situation, even with being in prison. Again, if he's somewhat used to that, then it's not a big deal if he gets out or not. But giving up that position of fame could be difficult. One other reason, if he's actually guilty, he is not simply ready to take responsibility. So it just could be that he doesn't want to admit he really did it, or he doesn't want to say that he was not allowed to do it. Like he could be justifying the homicide in his mind. Like to him, maybe she had it coming. So from his point of view, he's not truly guilty. So he could be hanging on to that, which could be going on for 20 years. I see that as possible. So how about the lessons learned in this case? Well, I have four that I came up with. The first one's pretty straightforward. Avoid homicide. It never provides a good result. Number two, the outcome of a trial is difficult to reverse. Prosecutors are often invested in the idea that a jury's finding is final. So once that verdict comes in, the prosecution wants to put that to bed and never revisit it. They just want to be gone forever. Number three, people often make terrible mistakes when they're young, and these are costly for the rest of their lives. And number four, sometimes people confuse the idea with making a perpetrator pay for the crime with making anyone pay for the crime. So to some people, it doesn't matter that Saeed appears to be not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. At least he's a person that is in prison because of that crime. It's always amazing to me how that can feel satisfactory. Like, obviously, people want justice for Heyman Lee, 
but having the wrong person in prison, or even having a person in prison when they're not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, is not consistent with justice. So this is my thoughts on the Hey Min Lee murder case. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.